call this meeting of the Westchester County Planning Board to order. Uh, first is the next three meeting dates. We're back in White Plains. This is the last of our this year tours. Uh, we've been to Playland and the, uh, the prison and Chappaqua Crossing. Excuse me, can we, the meetings have been called to order, folks? Um, so the next three dates are on the agenda. There's also in your package was a list of the meetings for next year. Um, the January meeting at the moment is if needed. Uh, if there's something that has to be approved, there will be a meeting. If not, uh, with all coming right after the holidays and everything, we'll, we might skip that meeting. I personally will not be at that meeting, but Dwight <coughs> assured me as the vice chair that he would be at that meeting. Okay. Excuse me, um, I can't hear a word you're saying. Well, I'll talk but as loud you, as yeah, I can. Yeah, just project a little bit, it would be great. You might want, maybe, does this mic No. no. Um, okay, next is the adoption of the minutes for the September 5th, 2018 meeting. Anyone have any corrections or additions they'd like to discuss? If not, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of September 5th? I will show. Second? Second. Two. Rennie, motion, James. Rene. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Yep. Opposed? Adoption of the minutes. Um, just to let everyone know, the County Planning Department is going to be holding training sessions with all the local municipalities on municipal referrals. Those are all the referrals we get from municipalities. And we get different levels of responses in terms of the information that is provided. So we're trying to let the, uh, the village, the town, the city clerks, and whoever is responsible for sending that information to the county, let them know the kind of information that we need to review it, and hopefully there'll be a good discussion uh, back and forth. And uh, the first one is in Greenberg uh, this Thursday at 9:30. Second one is at New Rochelle on October 11th. The third one is October 17th in Yorktown. Actually, there are four. The fourth one is in Northcastle Town Hall on the 23rd. Uh, Anyone is invited to come if you'd like to uh, participate. Um, the they may. Hmm? Where was the 17th one? The 17th one Yorktown. is at Yorktown Town Hall. <coughs> and uh, there may even be planning credits for anyone. There who, will be. There will be for people who need for uh, their AICP certification uh, to get planning yeah. credits. Can we just go to the date one? Yeah, sure. Thank you. We can di we'll distribute the dates. Okay, they'll all be the same, just with different municipalities right. participating. So obviously, going to one, we'll, you'll see the process. Okay, Commissioner? Um, just to build on that, just a reminder for all of you that you do have four hours of required training that you have to do each year to continue your membership on this board. Um, when you get a certificate, please email it in to us so that we can recorded in our files. Uh, some of you are really, really good about that, and others I don't think we've seen any certificates yet. So um, I do want to uh, compliment, Westchester Municipal Planning Federation does offer a bunch of trainings all year round. They had one in September that Holly and I both went to, uh, where they gave us a tour of Untermeyer Gardens in, in Yonkers, which was just wonderful to see the improvements and Beautiful. really bringing it back to Beautiful. life down there. Really. Um, and it was really nice. We actually had a, a directed tour by the, uh, by the director of the facility down there. So it really gave us a great history of what it took to get where they are and what their plans are going forward. So if you haven't been down there, I really, really highly recommend it. Um, Untermeyer Gardens was one of the award winners from this year's Westchester Municipal Planning Federation, the annual dinner. So it really, um, it was a great opportunity to, uh, for everybody to see why it won an award. The mayor of Yonkers was there joining us. The Parks Department, Tony Landy, was uh, commissioner was there. So uh, one of your former board members, okay. 
Um, so yeah, it was a great opportunity. There are a couple other trainings coming up. There is a training specifically for planning board members also coming up from them. So we'll get you those details as well. But like I said, the important thing is just make sure you get us the certificates either to Bill or my attention so that we give you the appropriate credit for the trainings that you've taken. You're allowed to do the four hours for this year and the four hours for next year in any given year. So um, if you do uh, more credits over the four, get us the certificates and get you the credit for next year. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's clear. We do have a hard and fast 10 o'clock end of meeting today. Um, for the board members, there is going to be a, a tour of the airport afterwards, but this room is booked for another meeting uh, after this planning board meeting. So we do have a hard and fast 10 a.m. finish time for this meeting. All right, that's, that's it for me. Okay, next on the agenda is the ratification of actions taken by the staff for the period August 16th through September 15th. You have them in your package. Um, we've gone over some of them. Uh, others uh, didn't involve any uh, comment by the uh, county. <coughs> anyone have any comments as to these referrals or anyone need to recuse themselves on any of these referrals? I just have a question about the North Castle, this um, payment in lieu of parking. Um, does anyone know? Anyone speak about that? Lucas? Uh, sure. Um, I just want to make sure that the payment that's received for that is going towards parking in an, another location, maybe. But that was our understanding. Um, yeah, it says here in the description, the expenditure of parking fund revenues shall be limited exclusively to those actions designed to provide parking spaces. So, so yeah, basically it, it will go for parking elsewhere. Okay. You know, because sometimes sites are constrained and you can't develop them because of the parking requirement. You basically can build nothing or, or you know, so this allows for that flexibility. Okay. as long as that's going towards parking. Right, right. Just, just to, to comment on that, there are, there are all kinds of payment in lieu. There's payment in lieu of uh, recreation space, there's payment in lieu of parking, there's payment in lieu of affordable housing, and many municipalities throughout this county have millions of dollars sitting in payment in lieu accounts that are not expended. Often if you get like payment in lieu of parking, 260000 200000 or whatever it is, you can't do anything until you build up you know, a whole fund, and so the money just sits there and sits there and sits there. So payment in lieu is not always the most effective way, but it is legal under uh, many zoning ordinances. Any other questions? Yeah, I have the, um, the Hale, Ab Hale Avenue residence. Yeah. Yep. That, that's not the old show your property, is it? No, no, no. Um, at least I don't think so. No. That's no, not the that. yeah, What was the, the question Hale again? Avenue. What, what is that location? I'm just trying to find out like, the location of where, where, where's your location. It's right. on ha it's on Hale Avenue, but there's like sites on each side of the street that on, they're developing. On Maple, on Maple Avenue. Yeah, like it's south of Maple. Just up from Bloomingdale Road, um, it's vacant site next to the source. You know, used to be fortunate off the source. So there's a couple of vacant sites oh, up the hill on Maple. Empty lot <coughs> on the yep. left hand mm -hmm. side. Yep. Okay. And they're, they're saying they're going to go up one extra story. Is what they're saying. Um. I believe so. Right, right, right. But they need a special permit for that height increase, not a variance. Okay. And across the street is where they're building the old Alexanders. Uh, yes, kind of diagonally across the street. So that's just not going to be the same floor. One will be huge, one will be a dwarf. Okay, all right. Got it. Got it. All right. Because it's a residential neighborhood that they're building. Right. The, these are going to be uh, seven story buildings, I believe. Those are Kind of more in. Yep. Well, they're, they're at the bottom of the hill, correct? There are two other new buildings, one under construction right. and then another completed one also up the hill, more in keeping mm -hmm. line with that okay. adjacent to the residential area. Yeah, there's a multi family building on the Cal, right there right. also, right yeah. near there, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm. That was that question. Right, that was my question. Right. I have a question about this one in Bedford. I'm not sure I understand what the amendments would do eliminate okay. residential preferences for middle income housing right okay so a bunch of um town and village ordinances and city ordinances have um 
it's kind of like a holdover from another time where you know we had affordable housing and they might have a two sets of affordable housing in this case because it's bedford they would have the f a fair and affordable uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing and then they would have like a workforce housing or middle income housing mm -hmm. and there were um residential um sometimes like residential preferences with that other set of housing and they're just one by one the municipalities are eliminating it so the people who were displaced from the area for the housing no longer get preference or residents of bedford would no longer get preference Re residency preferences are extremely frowned upon yes this is what so. the whole litigation issue right. was uh what it does is it perpetuates you know keeping the community the way it is as opposed to allowing people from outside the community an opportunity to move in and so they are frowned upon throughout the county not right. just bedford and many communities have adjusted their zoning to eliminate preferences it doesn't limit who applies for the unit right it's right generally speaking res local residents will still be the most prevalent applicants to live in housing that's built anywhere but it just eliminates the priority preference given to local residents based any, on their residency only. Any other questions, comments? Can I, I have? Just, I need to recuse myself from Jeff Crossing. From jo Jeff Jeff Crossing. So that went in here too. Okay, yes. Michael needs to uh, as, uh, recuse as himself. Do, as do I. I have to recuse my. I have Chapel to recuse Crossing. Chapel Crossing. Yes. I had a question about the Harrison, the two seventy-five. North okay. Um, it says that it's it's uh, close to St. Vincent's Hospital. Is, is the area that's going to be developed now uh, empty? Those lots are empty. Y yes, it's actually on St. Vincent's property. They want to subdivide a piece off of the property and then develop the building. It's so it is part of the St. Vincent's campus right now. It's I vacant. Saw this, like, right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. I gave a little presentation yeah. about it. I think it was in July. Right. Yeah, two months back. Yeah. They're still going forward with that, correct? Looks like it. Uh, well, okay, it came in with just a, um, like a, just a general informational referral, and we responded with a letter. And then it came in for lead agency in this report, and we responded, no objection to lead agency, and we made the same exact comments that we made in the previous letter. Have the residents of Harrison had a chance to speak about that? Because that's right on the country club right right um i mean it's all they've done is declared lead agency we'll know um if in a month or two they come back with a positive declaration and a scoping document we'll know that it's moving forward otherwise it may it may not okay. right. any other questions can i have a motion to approve the referrals michael i have a second Mena. Mena. all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed yeah, at this point, I just want maybe Hugh, you can introduce our airport people here. Okay. Yes. Good morning, everybody. So, um, the, the county airport is under the jurisdiction of the Department of uh, Transportation and, and Public Works. Uh, the board, uh, uh, we gave us a uh, synopsis earlier in the year. I had that uh, Naomi Klein in from my office on the transportation bus side component of transportation. This is uh, the other major component that my uh, uh, department administers. It's the airport. Uh, on the bus side, I just wanted to uh, inform the board that if you, if you saw last week, one of our first uh, hybrid electric articulated buses came in. And at this point, another four per month are going to be delivered. So we're excited about that. We, we expect that fleet to be complete by, by June. So that, that's a bus that the articulated part for those who don't know that's the one the big ones that 60 foot to bend in the middle they'll be all electric driven with just a diesel backup generator on so we're we're very excited that, about that on the bus transportation side on the uh, on the airport side uh, uh, the public works is with all count one of the, one of the many county facilities that we're in fact we're in charge of all the county facilities uh, maintaining them and, and keeping and, and of the capital programs and maintenance of them. The airport is one of the major aspects of that for our department, and uh, so that, that's where transportation and public works fits into the airport. Uh, the, as, as most of you know, Avports is, a, is an operational manager for the, for the, the public works doesn't operate the airport. Avports, which is a private firm for the last 30 or so, or so years under various names, has, has uh, 
has uh, uh, operated the airport. And uh, so as, uh, as the commissioner said, there's a bus tour later uh, that, uh, and, and Peter will be available to ask any, any questions that time uh, about his operations, how we handle things, it's, uh, uh, and any of the, uh, I guess, uh, how long would that tour be for the board, just so they have a sense? Well, the flight time is going to be probably about <laughs> 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 Everything's good. <laughs> what island are we going to? <laughs> Very good. And there'll be, uh, you know, drinks for five dollars. Thanks, fly free. So t today is at the request of the board. We we have our <coughs> consultant, DY consultant. Well, we're going to do that after. Oh, okay. All right. But would you like to say anything? Uh, uh, just, uh, just introduce us. I know you got a busy agenda here. Um, you know, again, the bus tour is where you get a lot of information as to how the airport runs and uh, what is going on in the airport. Uh, I don't want to take up the time right now to crowd the room, and I know you want to do some business. But maybe at a later time, we'll go into some more detail. But thanks for being Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, refer, referral of interest. I just wanted to ask you, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. new battery powered buses, are they going to replace or be in addition to? Replace, replace. one for one. There's 78 buses now, there'll be 78 additional buses. Uh, those buses are going to be on the main routes. You know, those are the, they'll actually have capacity over 120 withstanding, you know, 60 seat. So those are the central avenue, the main routes downtown Yonkers, uh, all the heavily trafficked areas. So. Okay. Sure. okay, so um, we have a current referral uh, that we wanted to bring to your attention before we send the letter. <laughs> we have until Friday to um, mail this letter uh, back to the town of North Castle. This is for the airport campus um, proposal. This is, has nothing to do with Westchester County Airport. It's, a, um, it's actually the MBIA campus that's up here at 113 King Street. Uh, this is a um, mostly vacant uh, office park campus, and the proposal is to, um, well here I'll just show you on the, uh, the proposal is to basically read, well this is what the um, property currently is, you have a, uh, a uh, office building with parking and uh, like a small building back here, and the idea is to construct a <coughs> 125 room hotel a 151 unit multifamily building, which would be here. The hotel would be here. And then um, 22 townhouses back here. Um, 100 uh, square feet of existing office would remain and be marketed to various office tenants. So um, this campus currently has uh, site plan approvals in place to allow, you know, looking at what's currently there, they currently have approval to construct an additional um, 165,000 square feet of office space, um, 53,000 square feet of amenity space, and a, and a meeting house, 20,000 square foot meeting house. They don't want to do that. <coughs> the um, proposed project with the residential building and the hotel is what they want to do in lieu of that. So um, we had this, pr we, I showed you the exact same three slides uh, back in July at your um, meeting when it came in for lead agency. Uh, we responded, um, no objection to lead agency with a couple of preliminary comments. Now, however, the project is moving forward. There is a positive declaration and um, they have prepared a, um, the applicant has prepared a uh, draft scoping document for the preparation of an um, environmental impact statement. So the letter that we prepared just responds to those um, scoping, that scoping document, um, which is just an outline for what the EIS would include. So um, just to walk you quickly through the comments, um, that we are recommending. The first is that the, um, the draft scoping document notes that the site is within close proximity to the county's airport. And so there's going to be a, um, a noise analysis in the, uh, in the environmental impact statement. Um, and we just recommended that that analysis just be like a, have a couple extra provisions in it um, is to be a little bit more focused and a little bit, uh, and, and that the, um, that the analysis could potentially draw a conclusion as to whether or not residential uses are a good idea here or not, based on that analysis. Um, also, the uh, the comments talk about um, maybe a possible need for a market study, in the sense that, um, and I brought this up back in, in July, that this is we're starting to see applications um, countywide for uh, apartment buildings that you would see like in an urban setting 
but proposed for like the middle of the woods. And this is one of these um, development applications. So it's a 151 unit building, six stories tall, out out here. Not, not near a downtown, not near any stores or services. This kind of runs <coughs> contrary to um, the policies in Westchester 2025, which call for the direction of that type of development to existing downtown centers. So, um, but beyond that, we're kind of concerned that because this is a new development concept in Westchester, it's rather untested. Do people, are people really looking to live in multifamily, six-story <coughs> apartment buildings in the middle of the woods like this? Um, we, the only one we have to go off of right now is the, the Monarch building at Ridge Hill Village Mall, which is a, which was approved for 500 units, kind of again out in the middle of nowhere, but that is next to a mall. At least you can walk to a store and whatnot, and Where that. Is that? The, it's you know when you go <coughs> on the throughway and you see the half constructed building next to the Ridge Hill Village Mall, that's the Monarch. Yeah, um, they only built one of four proposed built. It was approved for four buildings, only one exists, and they had a tough time selling the units. Then they had a tough time renting the units, and now it just kind of sits there as a half completed project. And so, because of that, it might make sense to do a market study to see if this, if this, if people want to live in a place like this. Also, in terms of the hotel, um, there's also a, a competing hotel proposal just up the road um, near the center of the Armagh uh, Hamlet. The town comprehensive plan mentioned that there was a need for a, ho a hotel, but is there a need for two hotels? We don't know. Um, so maybe a market study could include that as well. Um, and then finally, um, the, the, the comment, uh, the third <coughs> recommended comment was just a, a standard comment we make with most uh, scoping documents, which is just to have a very, very, very specific um, discussion about um, inflow and infiltration mitigation as part of the um, sanitary sewer analysis. This is in the Blindbrook Sewer District, so there will be an there will certainly, with the addition of residents, has been an increase in wastewater flow to the um, Blindbrook uh, uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility, and they should just do a very, very specific analysis of that. And that's it. So if if you're okay with it, we could send a letter out today, or we could make edits and changes depending on what you like. Any questions on this letter? The reason uh, we presented it in accordance with the sort of the policy we're saying now, if we're making a negative recommendation or at least a recommendation that additional studies are required in order to uh, re properly review a project, that, that it's going to come before this board before the letter goes out, so that if we all agree, um, it, it, the whole sense of the board, as opposed to being ratified afterwards. Uh, again, this is similar to the St. Vincent site uh, apartment building that is in the referral package today, which is, again, an apartment building middle of nowhere, not near downtown, not near public transportation. <laughs> and there are others as well. And so it does, as Lucas said, it doesn't comply with Westchester 2025 policy of uh, supporting the downtowns and not spreading development out into open areas. Uh, as a <coughs> so, um, if we all, if you agree, yeah. I have a question. Uh, what besides the negative development aspects? What else is the cost to the county if it flops? No cost. No, no, cost, no cost to the county other than it's. Uh, well, all right, it's yeah, but it's a nice Well, it is now too. Well, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's also opportunity cost, like because you tried something and right. it didn't work right. out. Now you can't do something right. so else. You're kind of left holding the bag with as it. As a county, or as the, the county, do they have to build sidewalks up? Do they have to build, you know, opportunities for people to go out and walk? Or is it just in the middle of nowhere and we leave it in the middle of nowhere? Also, if it flops, I'm sure there'll be a certiorari, which will reduce county, exactly. town, school taxes. I mean, it's, it's it's not really in walking distance of anything. Anything, right? It's, it's no, zero. you can't go anywhere from there. No. And are, you using, are they using the existing buildings, or are they no? Yeah, some 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 are are, are existing, reused. and some here I'll show you. Uh, some like this is what's currently there, right? And uh -oh. <laughs> and this is what's proposed. So as you can see, like this building remains, right? Right. But then this building is new, and this is all new. So there's, it's a combination of new and new and used, I guess. <coughs> Any other office building <coughs> being used now, or is M MI, whatever they are, out and going completely? No, I believe that they're gone. 
I believe that they're, they're gone. gone. Yeah. So it's this bacon. I, you know, I'm not 100% sure. It, I, I mean, it's definitely not full. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there could be yeah, like a, you never know. Sometimes people come and rent a little space here and there. You know. I mean, there is definitely a need for a hotel, more hotels in online. Right. I don't know if two, but you know, definitely. Well, there's one, one, right? Isn't the Quinta? The Quinta yeah. is the only one. Is the only one. Small. Small and it's, you know, needs to be renovated. <coughs> so it'd be nice to have something new. Yeah, for the apartments, just to going to add more people complaining about the airport right. noise. Right, I don't and know. I'm not saying the apartments But I could understand the hotel. Yeah. That makes the hotel sense, makes you know? Sense. Yeah. Any yeah. other comments? Good afternoon. Uh, is it okay for us to send out that letter? <coughs> so I'll send it out today, then. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, we have uh, three items for planning board action. Uh, the first one is the capital budget amendment for the uh, community college library building air conditioning equipment replacer. Good morning. Uh, Westchester Community College is asking for an uh, amendment to their capital budget for 2018-2019 for $1.1 million. Half of it, $550,000, is towards the replacement of their air conditioning system. This summer, late August, the system failed. Um, during hot, humid weather, um, they're replacing their 350-pound, 350-ton chillers here behind the building. We were at the building in June for our planning board meeting. This is the main entrance here. Um, again, it's a, uh, a large building, the old building, and the, the uh, addition from about 16, 17 years ago. Um, it failed. The community college said one of the, one of the issues was not only the, uh, the hot weather all this summer, is very hot humid summer, um, but the, uh, the control systems as part of this uh, system here, um, they were having difficulties with overnight power failures uh, where um, there were no staff on board and the units had to then kind of pull up again uh, in the middle of the night. So that strained the system this particularly this summer. And just another couple of views. Uh, we'll be taking a look at this project uh, when the plans come in. This is for design and construction. Uh, they're proposing to use the existing concrete pad outside the back of the building, uh, and they even think that the units might even be smaller or more efficient units. Again, replacing the, the chillers and the control systems. Um, this is just a little quick drawing. This is looking the other way, and there's the existing pads. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been out there using fans, dehumidifiers, doing everything they can. County staff is making sure there's no mold. Uh, our <coughs> management is inspecting it, making sure everyone's healthy and happy. And luckily, the weather's not too hot going forward. Um, and again, just in summary, $1.1 million. Replacing the 350-ton chillers. They're 16 years old. Typical uh, useful life is about 20 years, 20, 25 years. Um, and again, we'll be taking a look at the, uh, uh, the plans as they come in for any kind of physical impact on the college campus. So are there any questions on this proposal for a capital budget amendment? Can I have a motion to? Second. Michael and Rini. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Passes. Okay, the next item for planning board action is the new home land acquisition and housing implementation funds increase in appropriations. Okay, um, in at your July, no, at your August meeting, your board, the board approved two resolutions to support the development of two affordable housing developments. One was the redevelopment in downtown White Plains with uh, Brookfield, the White Plains Housing Authority, and the <coughs> second one was 25 South Regent Street in the village of Port Chester. Uh, as we were preparing the legislation to submit to the Board of Legislators, we did an accounting of the two programs in the capital budget and realized that we had actually over, well, we are, with these two resolutions, we actually overspend the New Homes Land and the HIF accounts, the capital program. So we do actually need your board to make a recommendation to um, do a capital budget amendment to put additional funds into these two programs. The 2019 budget will put money into both programs for next year, but to be able to do a full accounting for this year and get the legislation into the board, we need a capital budget amendment for both of the two developments that we came to you for in August. Okay, it's uh, 1650000 for infrastructure and $3 million. That was for the Brookfield, and then $3 million is for the New Homes land for the Port Chester development. 
and then additional money for additional developments will be will in come the, in with a capital budget the if, capital if, budget. if there's any additional ones this year <coughs> any questions or comments I have a motion Kathy and Michael. Michael all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed say no motion passes okay the last matter for planning board action is a capital budget amendment for stormwater manager Just a very brief presentation for you. This is a stream channel restoration project. We've done a number of these in the past. Uh, this is a portion of the Fulton <coughs> Brook north of the county center. This is the county center, southbound Bronx River Parkway, northbound Bronx River Parkway. We are going to be restoring a portion of the brook from here to here. Uh, big, basically, this is the property line. This is the Verizon building right next door, just uh, just north of the uh, county center. So. Yes, these are just some pictures of the existing conditions of the brook. It, it receives a lot of stormwater from Central Avenue 119 uh, through Greenberg, very urban area. Uh, so we get very, very high flows. And during storm flows, uh, this, the brook has been undercutting. And you can see down here, it's, it's digging down basically and then undercutting some of the stream bank there. So the intent of the project will be to uh, basically cut some of the stream back, back to stream bank down, reconnect the stream to the floodplain, and reduce some of those uh, erosive forces on the stream bank. And there's some other pictures. And I'm using the mouse now. All right. This is the project. This is going to be a, a future phase of the project with some additional funding. Right now, we're just asking for funding for from here to here. Again, county centers down here, the rising buildings up there, southbound Bronx River Parkway, northbound Bronx River Parkway. This kind of shows you a little bit of what we're going to do. We're going to be bringing the stream, we're cutting the stream bank back in this area, in this area, back down in here and here a lot, cleaning out some of the streams, some of the, some of the sedimentation in there, stabilizing the stream banks, and then revegetating it. That is basically it. It's funded with a grant from DEC, $475,000 from the Water Quality Improvement Program. We're asking for <coughs> another $400,000 to match that from BPL 40. <coughs> yes? Will this require any uh, rework on those bridges? No, we're actually, actually DPWT is, is working right now on some projects to, to do some work on the culverts here. Uh, that would improve, dramatically improve the flow of the brook through here. As you can see, it's doing some S turns, which uh, mm -hmm. also increase you know, velocity in those areas and cause a little sedimentation. So if we can kind of straighten this out to some extent, we would look at that too. Um, or even just straightening out the culverts themselves to kind of, you know, make you know, line the stream a little bit better, uh, we'd be looking at that. If those projects time line up, we'd love to, to design them together. Okay. If yes? I can just, just repeat, so what you're doing is you're going to essentially widen the stream bed and, and facilitate overflow into the floodplain. Exactly. Not 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 necessarily the stream bed, but the banks. So okay. at that full bank capacity, the stream will be a little bit wider. So you can see it like basically these orange areas down here will be put right. you know, pulling those stream bank banks. So right now they're really steep and cut down. That will slow up the velocity too. Yes. It'll yeah. Widen the slope. Yeah, and it'll help downstream people too. Uh, more stream bank for sediment control. And yeah, this is and flooding, flooding. Yeah, when when it, it especially the Bronx <laughs> River when <laughs> it floods, <laughs> you know, everything comes the water. So, uh, uh, but but it, whole area, that whole area actually is inundated over the bridges. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. This is a really bad part of the yeah. parkway. It floods very frequently, yeah. and when it floods, it, it, it floods. 
Uh, but as uh, Commissioner Grecian said, it's really more a sedimentation issue. We got some really bad problems with sedimentation all through this area that then causes problems downstream. The Commissioner, will this affect traffic at all? Uh, on this? No, not no. well. You, you have uh, also you have deliveries and that sort of thing, but it'd be temporary. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, there, there's coordination with our traffic department. We definitely need to be done. During yeah, the, well, during the construction, but there's no lane closures and anything associated with this particular project. The right. culvert replacement, depending on what we do, may may have some uh, one lane closures. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Sure. How long would it take <coughs> to do this? What's the ETA? Oh, it, depending on weather, all, all of our projects are seasonal. Uh, and then start to finish, I would say most of the excavation, there will be a lot of excavation removing some of that material. Uh, that should be take six months, Anthony, you think? About if we have some removal of the cylinder bases. We'll be done probably in June, July, and most of the excavation in the fall, and then wrapped up in the spring with the reestablishment. So it'll be like an eight month construction, but we're going to have the winter in the middle. Right. Yeah. So the between from herbicide application to final planting, we always like to leave about a year, year and a half. But it's not going to be a constant year and a half of work. Any other questions? And I have a motion to uh, approve the amendment to the capital project. Yeah. Ready? Two seconds. Two seconds. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Okay. Um, we discussed briefly the uh, meeting schedule. Uh, it's in your package. You know, take it home, compare it to your future calendars, and see if there are any issues. And you can let us know at the next meeting if there are any issues with the meeting dates. A couple of them had to be adjusted due to holidays or uh, or election day or various times from our normal first Tuesday. But the, so check your calendars. Okay, matter for board information. Um, Hugh, why don't you introduce the presenter? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this morning, and at a request, at the request of the board, we have a DY consultant uh, going, going to uh, give us a presentation on the current master plan. As uh, everybody knows, that uh, this master plan is the one that, that uh, was delivered uh, uh, to the <laughs> administration. We're in process of uh, formulating a new RFP for, for a new master plan moving forward. But uh, so today, it's again, it's DY Consultants. It's, it's Dennis Yap and Lior, um, uh, uh, Lior Dahan are going to do the presentation today. And uh, again, it's uh, I'll let them take over. But we are still in the process of, of moving forward with uh, certainly an update on this, <coughs> on this proposal. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to have this discussion about the master plan. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll start off <coughs> with general discussions about what the master plan is and the, the, the agenda, and then I'll pass it on to Leo, who is our project manager on this project. So the agenda that we have today is uh, we want to you know, get right into the recommendations that came out of the master plan. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about generally what's you know, the definition and the process, you know, why, why did we do a master plan. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce you a little bit to the team that was involved. It was a pretty big comprehensive study. It was not only DY consultants, but there was four experts that were sub-consultants to us on this, on this project. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll go through the document itself. We'll try to, we won't go through, you know, it's a thousand page document, so uh, we'll go through it rather quickly, but we'll go through each chapter to give you an understanding of what the process was and what came out of it. And then, and then we'll close with some concluding remarks. So uh, I'm just going to read through these and, you know, and, and talk a little bit about the recommendations. Uh, it, the first bullet, enhancing a safe environment that exists at the airport. Uh, wanted to comply to the newest security standards, update the aging infrastructure, uh, maintain an environmentally responsible approach, promote operational efficiencies, provide newest technology, and enhance passenger experiences. And all of this was to be done in an environment, as noted below, that uh, the, all the recommendations would still uh, comply to the terminal use agreement. 
or the terminal use regulation, and stay, uh, all development was to stay within the airport footprint. We were not to go outside the foot airport footprint. So, um, the first thing about the definition process, uh, Westchester County Airport is a public use airport, uh, and it's, it receives FAA funding. It's regulated often by FAA rules and regulations. They do accept grants from the FAA, and there's minimum standards that are involved when you accept grants from the FAA. Most importantly, they want to make sure it's a safe uh, aviation uh, facility and it's uh, a safe uh, environment for the flying public. And part of that process when going through this is, and, and we, we actually, the airport actually signs uh, grant assurances that they got to comply to these safety requirements. But as they move through and accept these grants, they're also required to, uh, to have a master plan in place. The, the master plan usually covers, it does cover a 20 year period, so it, it talks about a period from, you know, the development of an airport uh, for a 20 year period. The last master plan was done over 20 years ago, and so there was this need to provide this master plan. Um, so these are sort of bullet points that I typically see in the airport advisory circle standards of what a master plan should cover. Uh, the study uh, provides a, a short, uh, short, medium, and long-term capital investment uh, against future regional aviation need. Uh, the document, ex uh, document existing conditions and identify current issues. Uh, graphically present development and land use. Uh, define possible projects in detail to support environmental evaluations. Address potential issues and satisfy local, state, and federal regulations. Um, a lot of questions were also asked of us, what, it, you know, wh what is an airport master plan? It's not a construction document. It's not an engineering document. I it's a planning document. Uh, it's something that the board can use as the gui guideline for making decisions. Uh, none of the projects in here are approved for construction or design at, the point, at this point. Uh, what they are are that, that they are eligible for funding, some of them. Uh, FAA funding, by the way, uh, FAA funding primarily covers public use type of projects. So uh, a lot of the projects are like state of good repair, like if you have a runway that has cracks on it, they're repairing cracks. Uh, there's something there that uh, is assisting in the efficiency of the airport, or there's something there that even like they provide grants for fire trucks, uh, things of that sort. Um, every time the airport requi requests the grant for each of these individual projects, it goes through an approval process at that point too. Um, it's important to note, and the board goes through the approval process, the airport goes through the approval process, so each of these projects are basically placeholders that are in here, they're not for construction, uh, not even approved for funding at this point. Finally, the other thing is every master plan, it's, it's not a, uh, it, it's, it provides uh, sections in it about environmental overview, but it's not, it's, it, it's not a NEPA document, it's not a secret document. In fact, the master plan is always conditional upon proceeding and getting NEPA approval for any projects that you, that you decide to proceed with within that document. And as a matter of fact, that's always like the first line that's on a, a, a master plan and usually on the, on the airport layout plans. So it's important that you know that this, if any project was to move forward, it would have to come in front of the board again and go through the NEPA and the secret process before you could even proceed with any sort of construction project. And even when you go through the construction project, you'd have to go through the environmental permitting process. So this, all these projects are contingent upon going through that process before they would proceed with any project that's uh, within a master plan. Uh, the other, this is generally, I'm gonna talk very generally about the process and what's involved in the master plan. A lot of this is dictated by FAA standards. When they funded the project, and when the airport received the grant for the project, the scope of work was pretty much dictated to, to them. And the scope of work that we followed pretty much followed what the FAA was requiring in their document. So it begins with an inventory of the existing conditions. It talks about, uh, we do a research on the environmental overview of the existing conditions. So this is important for us to recognize when developing uh, the master plan. Uh, we go through an aviation forecast, which is very, very closely watched by the FAA when we go through it. Uh, in this case, there was a lot of discussion about the TUA and how it affects the forecast, constrained or unconstrained. Uh, it went back and forth quite a bit between us, the county, and with the FAA. Um, 
the FAA actually has their own sort of forecast they d that they do for all the airports. It's called a, um, a, ter it's a terminal area forecast. Uh, it doesn't probably go into as close detailed in individual of each community for their forecast, but they do have a forecast. Whenever we stray too far away from that forecast, there's a big discussion on whether or not they'll allow us to stray too far away on it. Uh, I'll let Leo talk a little bit more about how we got to where we are. But uh, we also recognize, and there's a big asterisk on it, is we definitely understood <laughs> that uh, we had to somehow comply with the TUA uh, while uh, addressing the forecast. The second part is the demand capacity analysis and the facility requirements. So at, at this point, after you do your forecast, whether it was for general aviation, commercial, or a small aircraft or a corporate aircraft, um, once we get the figures on the number of operations, the number of passengers, uh, we take that information and there's specific uh, techniques and developing what the facility requirements that the airport would need to accommodate that forecast for the future. It sort of creates the, the pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together for us to make th the final puzzle of, of your master plan. And then we develop alternatives and, and, and developed uh, alternatives and went through an evaluation process. And this is where we sort of, this is not sort of, this is where we handled the issue with the TUA. So we knew we had caps as far as passengers. We knew we had caps as far as gates. We knew we had ca cell caps. And through this process and through, uh, you know, through the, you know, the request of the county, uh, we did not follow the forecast when it came to the alternative development evaluation. We, we pared it down uh, to meet the county's uh, the needs. And from that, we developed a plan uh, with a narrative uh, and, uh, and put together an implementation plan, which basically develops this plan, goes from zero to five, five to 10, and 10 to 20 years. Again, it's um, this whole plan that gets put together, it's not a construction document, you, you know, there's things in there, things changing in it. It's, it's all up for discussion as, as you go through the process. Um, so the, the, the schedule process started in 2012. Uh, we did have public meetings in 2013. We went through charrette meetings. Uh, there was a period that we went through with the FAA on the traffic force test to get their approval. Uh, April 2016, we had the Board of Legislators meeting. The draft report and the ALP drawings were submitted in April 2017. The, the revised report uh, went in 2017. There was another public meeting in July 2017. Final master plan went in at the end of 2017. And we did make a presentation to the new county administration in February 2018. Excuse me, could this speaker um, try to... Yeah, we have air conditioning. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, so okay, I'll try to speak up. Okay. Um, our team, <coughs> like I mentioned before, uh, we had, uh, we were the prime consultants, DUI was the prime consultants, we we're aviation uh, consultants, um, we're, we're, uh, our specialty is in planning and in, 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 in airport engineering, focusing primarily on engineering. Uh, we added on VHB, um, a, fir a f local firm, but also a firm that we've worked with quite a bit. Uh, their primary roles was in forecasting and environmental. Uh, we had Lero on board, who was very strong engineers, has done a lot of work in the county, uh, was in involved in the stormwater and the drainage aspects of, of our study. Um, Dolph Welfare Engineering uh, was uh, added to our team to uh, provide input on the land side and the access road system to the plan. Um, semi, this, this study was very comprehensive. It not only included just master planning, but it also included other aspects that were added into it. There was an AGIS component, which is basically a geospatial graphical database uh, that was created for the airport. And in order to implement that and get that, uh, which is a requirement by the FAA now, uh, we had to get a surveyor that was an expert in putting things into the format that they were looking for. So we had Sim right on for the team for that. Um, we had Roy McQueen uh, and Associates who are uh, pavement experts uh, who did who was uh, asked to do a pavement management system for the project. So the FAA right now, before they f issue funds, if before they issue funds for overlaying or repairing existing runways, uh, they look for a pavement management expert to talk about the condition of the existing pavement, the life of the pavement, and when, what's, you know, when it would be appropriate time to get funding for it. Uh, that's, that's what Roy McQueen did. And then we had Frasco, who was a, a well-known uh, financial consultant to assist us with, with uh, the financial aspect of the plan. So that's basically our team. 
And now I'm going to, we'd like to just get into a little bit about the chapters and, and what was uh, found as part of the project. And I'm going to pass it on to Leo DeHaan to talk about that. Um, may I ask how we're doing on time? Um, we're talking about half an hour. <laughs> Yeah, speak into the mic. Oh. The, mic the, mic the mic is just for the video, it's not projected. This mic doesn't work? No. Okay. No, you should talk into it. You should talk into it for the video. You have to talk into the mic, but it doesn't make it easier. Sounds good. All right. It's interesting. You mic will pick you up. Just talk. All right, thank you. Thank you. So my, my name is uh, Leo Dahan. I was uh, lucky enough to be involved uh, at the beginning of the project in uh, 2012 at the kickoff meeting, and, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, hopefully, I try to provide as much technical information. Dennis left me the uh, the easy part uh, to talk about. You know what we've done um, since the kickoff. Like, like you said, uh, there's a there's a, there's a huge document, like more than a thousand pages, summarizing all the <coughs> findings, chapter by chapter. I'll try to give you uh, an overview. Of course, you know, feel free to uh, to interrupt if you have any questions. If I'm using terms that are too technical, um, apologize about that. So the first step, you know, when we start such a comprehensive study, was to collect as much as much information as possible. Uh, also review all the different studies and, and previous studies like the master plan, understand all the regulations at the county. Uh, we talked a lot about the TUA or the TUR, the terminal use regulations that actually affect uh, how this airport is being, you know, is, is run and how it can actually be developed. Uh, we also met with uh, all the tenants. Uh, we had meetings. We, someone with the county was with us. Everything, of course, was uh, documented. We met with the tenants to, uh, you know, survey all the facility understand how much you know uh, facility they have in square foot and understand also the wish list what what works right well and what needs to be improved um, we also had meetings with uh, we, we had a public meeting uh, in July 2013 a couple months after the kickoff to again present the inventory information that we have collected we flew the airport with a, an aerial survey uh, we got information about elevation of trees around the airport about all the facilities um, we had meetings with the air traffic control tower, <laughs> meeting with uh, airport operations to understand how the airport is run on the runways and the taxiway system. Um, we had meetings with the FA as well. I mean, those are th th the first step when we try to, you know, inventorize um, and, and understand the settings before we move forward. Um, we have to use, for the purpose of the master plan, since we're looking 20 years out as far as planning, we have to pick a year, which is called the base year. So the base year is the year that we start looking that we use as a base, uh, you know, for traffic information as well, and after that will be forecasted future predicted years. Um, throughout the report, uh, a lot of things happened during uh, the master plan, uh, and we, we'll talk about it, in a, I guess, in two slides. Uh, we are ac we have actually updated the master plan since we submitted end of this 2017. We updated with footnotes uh, all the uh, areas that need to be updated, so the document could be seen as a current document. So chapter two, which is, you know, the purpose of chapter two is very close to the first one, which is, uh, again, understanding the existing settings. We're not looking in the future. We just want to understand the settings of the airport, but more uh, with the environmental lens. Uh, so same thing, we had our expert uh, VHB. We did a wetland delineation survey to understand where are exactly the wetlands located, uh, which is the area that actually can be used, or we don't want to impact wetlands, or the state wetlands regulated, or, or a federal regulated wetlands. We, uh, we did a noise analysis as well, uh, which was collecting all the information from the existing traffic that we collected in 2012 and translated that into what we call noise controls and giving us, um, uh, BFA has a method approved called uh, using a software called INM and we draw uh, noise level controls around the airport. So as you can see, that, that's a, a little sketch here, but there's a lot of uh, data and all the traffic backup information included in the report. Um, we also looked at <coughs> all the de-icing practices, uh, stormwater practices, uh, you know, uh, inventorized all the threatened indigenous species <coughs> at the airport. Because um, usually when we have all this information, it helps us when we have to develop the proposed and the future plan, we need to understand what are our constraints because there are environmental aspects that we cannot uh, violate. Okay. Should add one more, uh, one more piece here. The airport has an AEMS, which is the Airport Environmental Management System. Uh, that granted actually the airport an award. Uh, it was the fourth airport in the country in 2004 to be awarded the ISO 14001 award, which is basically rewarding the airports that have established voluntary standards to control the impacts of their operations. Could be aircraft operations or it could be uh, any other type of operations at the airport. So it's quite famous for the type of airport that that size at least. 
All right. And then the next step, as Dennis mentioned, is once we understood the base and the, the traffic activity and who are the different, uh, I guess, operators, uh, you, you have to understand that here at this airport, we call it a general aviation airport, mainly. Uh, general aviation as opposed to commercial. Uh, commercial <coughs> meaning like the airlines like JetBlue, Delta, American. Uh, general aviation being everything else than those scheduled operations. It could be leisure, like flight school, or it could be corporate aviation. It could be um, what we call heavy general aviation. I'll try to discuss that a little bit. Uh, we had activity as well. We had FBOs, many FBOs when we started the study, which got consolidated a little bit. FBOs stand for fixed-based operators. Um, there are tenants at the airport that provide servicing to aircraft that come and need fueling, need storage, need maintenance. Uh, need some kind of services for people flying in and out, but not through the different airlines. So initially, when we started, we wanted to understand, if you want to have an idea, uh, this airport, around 25 to 30 percent of the traffic in 2012 was allocated to the volume, of, was allocated to air carrier operations, so airline operations, and everything else was more towards the general aviation activity. So we consider that airport as a busy, one of the busiest general aviation airport of the region, having a little bit of uh, commercial activity as well. So the, the, the first step, because it is required, uh, we are asked to look at the forecast of operations in a, uh, and forecast of passengers. We're trying to take a guess using all the different techniques that are approved in the industry to understand what could be coming here at the airport. We look at socioeconomic data, we look at uh, the GB GDP, uh, we look at historical activity, we look at parameters that we know that are specific to the airport, like let's say a low-cost carrier that wants to come and leave. When we started the master plan in 2012, uh, AirTran left the airport. And AirTran was quite a busy, uh, uh, quite a, you know, a conf an important operator here at the airport. That had quite an impact because as we started, we saw a drop of operations in, uh, in air traffic and claimants, I mean passengers, and operations of aircraft because of AirTran leaving the airport. As you could see, we, we are forecasting, this is a forecast number, that the operations between the base and the first five years was going down. And this was mainly affected by parameters like, like the fact that you know, AirTran left. So we looked at you know, fuel price as well. Combining all those techniques, we come up with a model that we have to discuss with the county, with the airport, and have it reviewed and approved by the FA, otherwise we cannot continue forward. And we received an approval from the FA, I think it was in 2015, but we can go back to the, the, the milestone, 2015, <laughs> saying that, the, uh, that, that, that the, the, the forecast that was developed for the airport was acceptable and was within the uh, margin of errors that they are developing on their own, using a model that is not as specific as what we have here. They're not looking at all the local aspects that we have seen. So again, this doesn't mean that this will arrive and this will uh, become the demand at the airport, <coughs> but we have to look at what can potentially come without looking at any other constraints. We just want to understand what could be coming here because of Westchester, because of the region, because of the economy. And that was the exercise. Now, let me give you just a little bit of understanding of different trends that we could see at HPN. So HPN is the code for the airport. Um, I'll use that quite a bit during the presentation. <coughs> and then what we've seen in the, uh, in the uh, industry, like, you know, that are trends uh, in the nation, not just, you know, applicable here. The light general aviation, like, you know, small aircraft, four-seaters, uh, piston aircraft, we've seen that as a decreasing activity. I'm not getting into why, but we've seen that, you know, not just at Westchester, pretty much everywhere. And, and we've seen that here as well when we looked at the historical activity. Corporate aviation, so... Uh, for instance, I, I don't know if you know, but here at, you know, at, the, at the airport we have uh, tenants like uh, PepsiCo, uh, IBM, uh, JP Morgan, Citigroup that have their own aircraft for business reasons and then their own hangars as well, where they park the aircraft and all the related activity. And we've seen that as a growing activity, more demand, people asking for more hangars, uh, more space outside the hangar, what we call the ramp, to be able to park the aircraft and getting in and out. Um, and the aircraft are getting bigger and bigger. We want to go, f I guess, you know, um, that's what we've seen, that the aircraft are getting, uh, you know, bigger in size. Uh, and that the hangars today, here at the airport, are in need of repair. Commercial side, what we've seen as we started is we saw, de de you know, decreased activity in commercial traffic. But the forecast is telling us that we, you know, according like to midterm towards 2022, would start uh, recover for that activity. Again, this is a forecast. Like we, we usually say that forecasts are always wrong. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I'll show you a little bit of, you know, what happened since 2012 because it's easy because we've done the 2012 base here. Everything else was forecasted. On the next slide, I'll show you a little bit of, you know, what happened between 2012 and 2017, but actual data, whether th this was in the right track or not. FBOs. So when we started, we met with all different FBOs. We had uh, Signature, uh, Landmark, um, Performance, Panorama, Millionaire. 
And during the course of the master plan, there was some merger and acquisition. I'm not going to go through all of them, but Panorama and Performance are not there anymore. We're acquired by Landmark and Signature. So we had Signature East and West, Landmark East and West, and Millionaire. And then uh, uh, I guess Signature acquired Landmark, but they had to dive us into we have Ross. So there's a lot of change here in the uh, landscape for, uh, for different FBOs. Um, <coughs> So this is not the forecast. This is traffic information that we have recorded through, the, typo, through the, the traffic count called Airport Monitor. So the airport here uh, submits on a monthly basis, uh, provides those reporting uh, uh, charts about activity at the airport that they have recorded from the airlines. So we, th this is only related to people flying on air carrier aircraft. And we've seen, uh, until 2017, a drop a little bit of activities on a yearly basis. And that's something that was also in the forecast, so I guess not so off on, 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 on this part. Uh, the next one is, so I explained at the beginning that we have three types of activity, airline, corporate, and general aviation traffic. So we tried by that chart just to show a bit what happened, because we want this document to stay current. So what happened since uh, the master plan? So 2012 was the base here, and, and this is historical information. So if I start with the yellow, which is the most predominant color here on the screen, uh, this is a corporate operations, and we see that corporate operations, so count of traffic operations, have actually uh, increased as far as number of operations uh, on a yearly basis and keeps on increasing. And again, this is consistent with the trend that we've seen, that we've been seeing. Light general aviation, we've seen this decreasing activity, but a little bit of uh, uh, recovery towards the end of 2017. Let's see if you know, it keeps on coming. That's good news. Uh, for the airport, as far as airline operations, this is the light, the, the dark blue actually, within the operations coming down, and that's what we discussed in the previous slides as well. Uh, so this is the number of traffic operations before it was more like a passenger side. So th that, was th that was the intent of the forecast, is just building, understanding what could be the demand out there, and the just slides that I showed you before were slides about what happened between our forecast and today. This map is a little crowded, a lot of colors, and I'm going to go through all of this. It's just to understand that as we finished um, the review of the existing condition at the airport through the meetings uh, before the different stakeholders that I mentioned at the beginning, we understood what uh, was right and wrong at the airport. I, I want to use the word deficiency, and maybe not the best word, but we've highlighted here the deficiencies and the area that need to be um, updated. Deficiencies doesn't mean uh, that it, it could be an objective deficiency, meaning not meeting standards from the FAA, like we don't have enough separation between runway to taxi, et cetera. Or it could be a subjective deficiency, meaning w w we heard from everyone that this needs to be improved. Uh, and so, and, and we looked at industry practices, industry standards, and we realized that actually there is something here that needs to be improved. Um, I, I guess I'm just going to use maybe one or two examples just to understand this, and, and then you'll see the proposed plan so you understand how we went from the existing to the proposed. But this map of deficiencies helped us you know, summarizing the existing path and moving forward. So I'm using, this is a main way where the aircraft are actually taking off and landing. And this is a main taxiway. We are sitting actually here in the terminal building. And um, as you can see, in the, the, the runway to the taxiway, there is a certain separation that is actually straight here, but then it goes up to a different number. So we have 520 and then towards 550 feet separation between the runway and the adjacent taxiway. Well, the standards requires 400 feet only. So one aspect of the master plan would be to say, I'm not adding anything. I just want to make it better. I'm going to take that taxiway and bring it closer to the standards, the minimum. I don't have to provide more than that. And this will open up more space here for the different, those are the different operators that we have, different buildings. They've been complaining here, and we have, I guess, people from the airport, they can relay that. When the aircraft is sitting here at the gate, when there is no room behind the aircraft for all the servicing uh, carts to drive be, uh, behind, behind the tail of the aircraft, because we don't have enough space, Otherwise, an aircraft being on the taxi would be an obstruction. So one thing that they, they've asked to do is give me enough depth so I can have my you know, fuel truck or baggage truck, whatever, just drive behind the aircraft without violating the, the safety area. So if we do that, we bring the taxi over here, then we open up a little bit more depth, and I can help us save that safety. I'm just saying that this map helped us understand that we're not trying to fix one piece by one piece, we're trying to find a plan that is a comprehensive plan and can be consolidated. So as we fix one thing, actually it's going to help another deficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Again, if there are questions, I'm happy to talk. There are a lot of things here. We're talking about Navit, we're talking about uh, the, the, the remain overnight space, which is an important topic that affects security as well. Remain overnight, all the aircraft that are sleeping at the airport are staying here at the airport for early morning departures. So we have aircraft sitting here at the, the gate, and we have aircraft sitting on the green spaces, like you see here, here, and here. On the morning, Early morning, the aircraft needs to come empty 
to pick up passengers. But then we take off from here. So what happens is you have aircraft coming with passengers in this way to take off, but you have the other aircraft coming the other way, heads on situation. To come here to try to pick up the passengers, go back to the takeoff point when we take off from that runway end. So what it means, it means that this space for remain overnight is not well located. Again, we're trying to solve that. Uh, I don't want to be, again, I'd be happy to talk for hours about this, but I've been told I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so once we understood all the deficiencies and we looked at the demand, we take that demand and we say the demand is defining what we would like to have in the future. And we translate that demand that you see the forecast, we translate that demand into, uh, let's say, the number of gates that we need, uh, the size of the terminal. We, we take that there are ratios that take us from this number to a square footage. And we say we need a bigger terminal, we need more gates. But then the process is we cannot do that because we have to comply with the vision of the county, which is to maintain requirements by the TUA, or the Terminal Use Regulations. What are, what are those requirements, if you know them? Three or four of them mainly, that we all know. Uh, for instance, the number of gates. We have six gates, but we have only <coughs> four jet bridges at the airport, outside. So two of them we have no jet bridges. Now, the, the regulations say that we cannot have more than four active positions. Active meaning we cannot operate more, serve more than four aircraft at the same time. That's, the, that's a, cons a constraint that we have the TUA. So if we come with the demand saying, I need six active positions, then the conclusion of the master plan is we cannot do that. We will provide, and you'll see in the plan, only four positions. Uh, just to uh, give you a couple of examples. Of course, when we look at all the requirements, we're trying to, uh, you know, to address the capacity shortfall, so we understand from the existing settings what is the capacity of the terminal, how many passengers we can safely accommodate, safely accommodate, not like in this room, like <laughs> I guess providing a level of service that is according to the standards at the, at the county. And, and, and we're trying to see if we meet standards from the FA, and we try to see if we meet the airport vision. We take all that, we review all the different elements, the air side, which is all the pavement outside, runway taxiway system. We look at the commercial passenger terminal building, which is where we sit, and you know, the baggage system, and the checking counters, et cetera, et cetera. We look at the general commercial <coughs> aviation, so their buildings, their ramps, and then the support facilities like fuel form, like um, uh, the customs uh, off, which is the firefighters uh, location, and we try to make sure that all the support facilities that, that allow the airport to operate actually have the right space and have it a, a good location to operate. So take all that, we combine it into this uh, alternative development evaluation. We met with, um, we had a charrette session in December 2014, which was a full day here, and we invited all the, the, the tenants and then the airport users and stakeholders and the county and the FA, et cetera, to come and discuss and review all the deficiencies that we've highlighted and then show them and discuss all together as a group what could be potential solution of how to fix this and how to address it. And, and we sat down, it was like a you know, walking session, it was very nice, full day, and we come up with some good ideas about how to address some of the deficiencies that we, uh, that we highlighted. Of course, we don't have one option. We initially had many more, but we considered only 13 for conceptual development. And then we had our TSC technical steering committee uh, having, you know, providing input and screening. We took it down to four, then to three. Then we met with, you know, again, stakeholders and we refined it to a draft preferred <coughs> option uh, leading towards the preferred alternative. And I guess that's what we may want to discuss. So if you, if you look at the previous plan and how uh, we came to this one, which is, again, like Dennis mentioned before, it's not a construction document. It's a, it's a nice uh, pretty picture. Uh, that is, is built to standards. Uh, so as you, if you remember from before, now you have the yellow taxiway here, which is you know relocated further down. So I have more space. Um, so you know, I, I'll, I'll try to give you a little you know synopsis, trying to be organized in the in the main aspects of the proposed plan here. Uh, that what we have done again. If you look at the first thing, you could notice that this blue line is the airport property line. As you can see, there are no facilities that are going outside. We're staying within the existing airport footprint. We're not going outside. The second thing that you must note is the main system, the runway and the taxiway. Usually, and for most of the master plan that I've worked on, uh, there is either like a new runway, a new taxiway, a taxiway extension, a taxiway realignment. Something happens. As you can see on the runway system, we have two main runways. Those, this one is for the little aircraft. This one is for the biggest aircraft. Uh, the main runway 1634. As you can see, we're not adding runway, we're not extending runway, we're not rotating the runways, we're keeping them as is. There's no extension at the end, nothing. It stays exactly as it was. This is shown as a light gray. Uh, what we are doing is a reorganization of uh, the taxiways here for efficiency and safety. Uh, those taxiways that you can see here, I should have brought like an you know, like existing of our proposed that would have been nicer, but Let's say we have, this one is called the high-speed exit. So this taxiway allows the aircraft to come out of the runway at a greater speed. 
And that's good because as a, what we want to do, and we can talk to the tower operation people, we want to get the aircraft out of the runway as fast as possible. Because we don't want an aircraft sitting on the runway. It's not for capacity reasons, it's also safety reasons. We don't want to have a runway incursion, what we call it, an aircraft crossing the runway and there's another one here. So if we can have high-speed exits, it's better. So we are recommending actually one here and one here to serve the different areas. We could be discussing you know, further stages whether only one is, is useful. I mean, that's uh, up for discussion. So th th that's the first thing. The main piece of, I guess, this reorganization would be alpha here that we brought you know, further back so we have more room here for like enough depth for the aircraft parking. And we did the same thing here. Uh, we took the, air, the taxiway that was actually further away and we brought it back. That opens up a little bit more area. I think the only part that I'd like to discuss is this area here, which is, which is called the X Air National Guard site, uh, ANG site. Just they use for, uh, w you know, after the, after the inventory, we realized that it was either underutilized or vacant or obsolete, or have a use that actually can be relocated somewhere else. And as we heard that there was a lot of need also for additional hangars to park aircraft, we, re we are recommending to develop that area in, in green, so that's basically the, the green is the hangar. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this would be a hangar bay, the same size as what we have here, which is a landmark hangar, uh, hangar seat uh, that we have here. So basically, you know, this is the same size that we are proposing just to open up this as a, as a village for additional hangars. It could be used for any different type of hangars that have to be for FBO or for a new corporate. But it's just space available there that we could use instead of having it vacant. And this is an additional parking lot. A uh, parking lot is something important that we heard uh, during the inventory that most of the time we fill up the parking lot, this one quite a bit, about 75% mm -hmm. of its capacity is often filled. Because we're not talking about a you know, simple day, we're talking like about you know typical day when we have busy activity. And that's something that we needed to provide additional parking spaces. Uh, this doesn't take into account <coughs> all the off airport options that are about parking, because we're just focused on what it is here. Again, before we go and we decide let's to build a garage, There'll be a study done about you know how much do we have and how much do we need. And then uh, uh, regarding the you remain overnight space that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. we are now putting them here. Uh, those are going to be the, uh, the the aircraft that you know just close to the terminal. They stay here, and they'll be uh, uh, <coughs> instead of being scattered around the terminal around the airfield, they're going to be located here. And this was where signature is, and we're recommending signature either going here or going somewhere here. One thing as well is important to point out is during the master plan, of course, during four or five years, the airport is busy and the county as well was very busy. A lot of studies were going on. Proposals, uh, offers, redevelopment. Millionaire decided to redevelop and submitted a plan to redevelop their, their, their piece of land. Um, at the same time, there was uh, right here a development of all the de-icing uh, tanks and underground tanks and system to collect the de-icing activity from all the aircraft operating in this area. And it's going by phase. Uh, at the same time, there was a stormwater uh, <coughs> upgrade and, uh, and a detention basins A and B being improved. And all that, I mean, <coughs> our job was to consolidate and brought all the projects that are actually at a stage of approval um, enough advanced to bring them into the master plan view because that was part of what's coming up next. There's one project, for instance, about the departure bump here for the, for the launch to be extended. That was in planning or design stage, but we were told that it's not enough advanced to be included in the master plan, so you won't see it here. One important thing as well is the red area around the master, around the terminal. Uh, we are saying today in our analysis of when we compare the demand versus the capacity, we're saying that not even looking at the future, I'm talking about today, today the terminal, ca the terminal capacity is not enough to handle the activity up to 2013 level. We don't have enough space in the terminal. I mean, we can relay that in different ways. You, you may have witnessed it yourself in the terminal that we don't have, again, this, this goes, we have standards, we have ratios in the industry. And we say, if we have X amount of passengers per hour, we should provide X amount of square feet of check-in counters and passenger hold room areas, et cetera. So by using that technique, we realize that we don't have enough space. So we would come in a typical master plan. If we don't have the TU and the constraints, we would say we need to extend the terminal. Either way, find a way it could be east-west, wherever we have room. But in this one, we're not extending the terminal in the proposed plan. We're not adding any gates. As you can see, the six gates are still here, four are bridged, two are unbridged. What we're saying is we are reserving an area here. In case one day something happens, regulation evolves during the course of the master plan for 20 years. Something happens and there is room and a need and a willingness to develop and expand the terminal, but at least the plan that we have provided here includes for that. This is commercial, this is a, how do you call it, proposed area reserved for commercial addition activity. We shouldn't be using it for anything else, it's just reserved. Well, the kind of improvements that we've been discussing, there's also the location of customs. <coughs> customs is here today and we recommend to put in a centralized pad here to better serve the aircraft. So the aircraft that actually come 
and have to port here instead of coming, going to custom, and then crossing again, which is crossing twice, which we're going to put it as centralized location. So they come, they exit the runway, they go to customs, and then they would go to their uh, location. Uh, so that was the existing plan. And actually, I had it existing in future. And those are all the different elements actually I, I discussed, so I'm going to skip through this. <coughs> I may have may have forgotten some points, but I guess we'll, we can talk about it in the q &A. All right, and then this is the most, most important part. Now we go to the airport layout plan. So formalizing this proposed option you could see before in professional drawings at a format requested by the FAA to be submitted for uh, review and discussion. As you can see, some of the drawings may include profile view that we have to put the trees and the obstacles and show that we are actually not penetrating the airspace. So we have to do what we call a plan and profile drawing using the proposed uh, configuration. We're showing, of course, the, the plan with all the in different imaginary surfaces that are associated to the uh, protection of the, uh, of the operations on the ground. <coughs> and this set, I think we had uh, 10 or 11 drawings, uh, was submitted, of course, to the county, but to the FA as well for signature, and they have to sign on the proposed plan only, which is one of the 12 drawings. Dennis mentioned that as well, that you know, we're not just giving you a pretty picture, we're trying to see if it makes sense you know, and how much it would cost to go. So we broke down all the uh, master picture, proposed plan, we broke it down into 16 or 17 projects and we gave you a cost, estimated cost planning level for each project and also a sequence of what we should be doing. So phase one may include three or four of them. For instance, phase one we recommend starting with the National Guard side redevelopment. Um, <coughs> It's a, and then we go with a lower sort of priority and looking at the schedule as well. So that's a, that's a facility implementation plan for the order and the cost associated with the schedule. And we're also trying to show you which is the source of funding that you could be applying for to try to get the project built with the support of the FA, because of course all those projects are eligible for federal funding. Um, that was, a, that, was a, that was a nice chapter as well. The, uh, we did an inventory of the, the sustainability practices at the airport and, and uh, what we do. And then we, after understanding what you guys do a lot already, we just you know, brought up some additional initiatives for sustainability practices that we could see in our other airports. But it's just keep on going on, uh, on the great environmental you know, uh, 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 system that we have developed here at the airport. And the last chapter deals with the public involvement program. Uh, it is required. Uh, through an FA master plan to involve <coughs> the public, even if the public, let's say, doesn't have a technical input uh, to the study or to the program, but the, 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 the public needs to be at least notified of what's going on, of what we're looking at, and just saying the process. So we had the first one, uh, July, 27, July 2013, so a couple of months after the kickoff, which was November 2012. Um, the first we had enough, just up, up to the forecast. We had chapter one and chapter two. So a lot of information we had boards across uh, across the hall. We invited all the public at first with the different notification system that that we have today, and then we were we manned all the different stations. I think we had nine stations. We had videos, we had boards, and we tried to show what is the airport, what is Westchester County, the uh, the economic impact of the airport to the to the region, and discuss. You know, people we we left forms. Um, people uh, filled out forms and sent us forms back, which we processed and and, and it's listed as well in the in the in the master plan. You could look at chapter nine, and after when we. Uh, uh, July 2017, so it was a couple of months ago, we had another public meeting when we presented the uh, proposed, some, some kind of similar presentation like that, the proposed master plan, and we discussed with the public. We had uh, a great amount of comments and input from the public. Uh, there was a public comment period open until end of August, I believe, and we received more than 100 comments, um, and we, s we addressed all the comments in, in updating the report uh, to the master plan should say that the master plan, the first draft was submitted in April 2017. Mm -hmm. The second draft was submitted in July to the county, uh, uh, addressing the comments from the county and from the FAA. And the third draft was after addressing the comments from the, or including, I should say, the comments from the public. <coughs> uh, and that was more towards October, November. We finalized that formatting and packaging it all by December. And that was the, uh, that was the end of it. I think I'm getting close to wrapping it up, if you want to yeah. uh, yeah. close it up. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll take questions. We'll find better right after this, but um, yeah, I guess what you heard a lot from uh, this is the last one. Yeah, this is okay. Uh, I guess what you heard a lot from Lior was that uh, a lot of this plan was directed towards safety uh, and efficiencies and uh, reducing delays and uh, things of that sort, and, and that's what we saw out there. It's important to note that the standards that were set in this plan 
uh, it's no greater, as a matter of fact, it's actually, it actually pairs down the effort a little bit, and when you talk about the taxiway separations, that the standards that we're meeting is meeting the existing traffic. If the standards that are in this plan is exactly the traffic that you have today. So it's not, it doesn't show an impact that you're going to add more demanding or bigger aircraft at the airport. This, this standard meets the existing standards. So in summary, the things that we did, we preserved the operations within the airport footprint. We complied with the TUR, uh, the no new runways and the no runway extensions. Uh, the gate count, uh, count remains the same, like I said, the four gates and the two uh, non-jet gates, non, not, not being used simultaneously, four gates. The terminal use agreement remains in effect. Uh, the voluntary curfew remains in effect. And again, the emphasis was <coughs> to put the airport into the standards that are for basically the existing aircraft. Uh, it's, not, it's not a growth plan at all, I, I can tell you that. And that's basically our presentation, so. Thank you very much. Um, excuse me, the board will speak first. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the plan that there was going to be new technology, so, so if you could briefly tell us what that technology is. Could the speaker raise, raise her voice? I'm sorry. Just <coughs> I'm sorry. That in the plan they mentioned that there was going to be new technology, and I was curious as to what the new technology is. One of them that, that was implemented during the during the master plan, but she also. Uh, I'm sorry. One, sorry about that. Uh, one one technology, and it may be a lot, especially in what we do if we decide to do something in the terminal, but we're not getting into the terminal operations like we could have seen new machines here in, in, in the terminal. But that's not what we're talking about. I'm going to give you one, for instance, that I just I'm thinking about, is what we call the navigational aids. Um, so the the. Um, the technology outside the airport close to the runway, so they're helping the pilots to land. On a day like today, we have the expert in the room, Mr. Ferguson, uh, but on day today with a lot of uh, fog, like, uh, you know, landing can be complicated, meaning uh, when the aircraft wants to execute a landing, if we don't have enough of um, a ceiling height for the cloud, if the cloud are not high enough, and he doesn't see the runway at a certain distance of the airport, he has to do what we call a missed approach. Is I and, and it could be, you know, if passengers aboard, and you could, could try again until the weather improves. So what we had to do is, for instance, um, bring on this runway uh, pre more precise approach technology that would, for instance, adding an approach light system here with like uh, the intensity more important than what we have today that would help the airport actually, that would help the air aircraft trying to land to see the runways from further and going through the fog as well. This is called the Special Authorization CAT 2. Uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of technology that is available today that we could put a request to the FAA, add a little bit of infrastructure like an, a, a ramp of approach lights, um, and of course having some kind of backup system for the generators in case that doesn't work to help the, to have the pilot go through the foggy situation and, and land safely at the airport. And if that helps, that, that's one technology for instance <coughs> that we're recommending on the other end. Are you able to just um, briefly mention some of the noise control going forward, what you would suggest? So, um, so good point. Um, I'm, I'm using, this is the existing one, okay? I'm just using that map just for, for the <coughs> question here. <coughs> um, this shows in red the in, in red, the intensity, as you're close to the runway, mm -hmm. the intensity of noise being perceived is greater than when you're on the green area, okay? The green area, if I, if I, I don't really take back to the legend here, but is a 65 DNL. So the FA has established that there is a noise level intensity that is acceptable. And everything, all the, uh, all the properties that are falling within that contour that need to be addressed for, you know, this, there, there, are, there are solutions could be. A, we could acquire the, the property, we could do an installation program, we could change the flight tracks, we could uh, uh, forbid certain type of operations to occur, we can put a curfew, we could uh, tell some operators that have some old engines uh, to replace the engines to have less, you know, less noise. So what I'm, this is the existing. On the proposed one, we did the same thing. We took the proposed activity from the forecast and we used the software called the INM and we superimposed that. 
and everything that is falling, all the properties, and that was <coughs> quite a good example, but all the properties that are falling within the 65 DNA contours have been, for that preferred option, have been uh, selected for a uh, noise protection program. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is we're not moving the runway ends. So this is, there's, there's no change as far as, no much about the contour. The only thing that changes is the type of aircraft. Because in the future, we'll see more recent aircraft than what we have today. And funnily enough, if you look at the chapter of the noise impact on the proposed plan, you'll see a footprint that is actually shorter than the existing one. Because some of the older aircraft, according to the forecast, are supposed to be phased out from that airport. Okay. We, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're running out of time. I just yeah. wanted the commissioner to make a comment. And then I'm willing to go. Uh, we'll tell the airport we can stay an extra 10 minutes and maybe some of the uh, public can get a chance to speak, but we're going to have to limit it because we have to be out of this room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the county has submitted this um, master plan to the FAA, the, but however, the county executive and the administration have recognized that there are a couple additional things that they really want to study. Um, and so they have asked the planning department to prepare an RFP for a supplement to this master plan. Um, your planning, the planning board members have not seen this yet. It was uh, handed out just last Wednesday evening to the airport advisory board for their ability to be able to review it and they are, have been directed to get any comments they have to the chairman of the airport advisory board by next Friday. So I'm going to distribute for our planning board members a copy of the <coughs> draft RFP for your comments. Uh, we will ask that you get your comments back, if any, to this RFP to Bill by next Friday, October 12th. Um, like, you know, again, for members of the public, this is the first time the planning board is seeing this RP RFP as well. So um, they are not prepared to comment on it or anything else at this point. So <coughs> with that said, so I just want to email. Yeah. I can distribute it by email if you'd like, yes. So I obviously haven't read this. I think this is a great presentation. Personally, I live you know, less than a half a mile from here. Uh, the only concern I had on that was the long-term parking. Is that going to be reviewed? I know obviously there's some issues with the current long-term parking and that landlord. Is that going to all be taken into effect as we move forward to this progress process? Well, well, well that's, that's a, uh, you know, again, like we put on a plan, we, you know, we document your concern. Uh, now it's up to the, up to the county how they would want to move forward with, with, with any sort of improvements as far as parking. Uh, if you may just add on, 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 on this is a, uh, Again, uh, we look at how many passengers we have in the future, and we say according to the standards, there are ratios that say if you have a million passengers a year, you need to have X amount of parking spaces. And we can go into like something more detailed instead of the floors. And, and, and what happened today is we see a lot, for instance, of um, uh, involvement of the new type of technologies like Uber or, uh, or Lyft uh, that are actually on all the airports, that it changes the requirements. So these industry standards are not valid anymore. So we come up and we say we counted the number of parking spaces, so you don't have enough according to the standards, so we'll add it. But now with new technologies and new things that are coming, is one thing I, I should have responded, then that we can actually decrease the need of uh, the parking spaces that we need at the airport. So th this definitely will evolve as we get to this, yes. Okay, I'd like um, to please limit yourself to three minutes. We'll take uh, three or four people. Yes, sir? Did you want to speak? Yes. Um, would you give your name? Direct would you give your name and, and direct your comments to the board and give your name, please? My name is Ben Thorne and I'm a resident. When I look at the executive summary that you have placed up on the board, it appears that actually nothing looks like changing at the airport. I mean, the summary says that everything seems to be the same. No runway extensions, no new runways and so on. But yet, there must be many things that are changing at the airport. I think it would be helpful if you had a summary of what actually is changing. For example, are hangers expanding? Are you building new hangers? Are aprons expanding? Are you building or adding any additional instrumentation onto the runway? Are you going to actually make the second runway precision runway, or are you going to leave it without any VORs or ILS at all? And that seems to be missing in this plan. So I don't think that everybody gets a feel of what really is changing in the airport. Thank just you. by looking at this update. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jonathan Wong. I'm a member of the Westchester County Airport Advisory Board, and I lead citizens for responsible county airport. 
I'm baffled that DY is presenting today because the County Executive George Latimer has already said that they are submitting, the County has submitted this master plan without prejudice and does not endorse its findings. I'm further baffled that DY claims that there is no expansion when their plan continues to call for $153 million in funds to build three new hangars. And I'm baffled that DY claims that, they're, that they've been, they have an analyzed the impact on the environment when their plan continues to claim that there will be no increase in greenhouse gas emissions despite the increase in capacity that will lead to an increase in flights. With respect to the draft RFP that's been circulated, <laughs> I'd like to know who wrote that proposal and whether he or she attended any of the three June public hearings about the airport. In those hearings, the near unanimous feedback was that the current environmental impact of the airport, and especially its noise impact, is unacceptable. Shamefully, that RFP has lower environmental aspirations than the Astorino administration. While their plan completely ignored the environment, ultimately, at least its scoping documents specified that the consultant must, quote, always keep the environment, stormwater management, water and air quality, and noise abatement in mind throughout the entire process. In the RFP before you, the environment is relegated to task three after economic <coughs> development and capacity expansion. That RFP doesn't even identify air quality or noise abatement as goals or priorities. Indeed, task one is to, quote, identify steps necessary to retain or attract economic activity at the airport. Apparently, being the third busiest airport in New York State isn't enough. The county instead seeks to increase economic activity despite the fact that this will come at further environmental cost. Task two is to improve an operational safety and efficiency, which is code for an expansion of capacity. The airport is adequately safe today. Over 150,000 takeoffs and landings occur each year without incident. The airport is certainly efficient today. During peak times, the aircraft lands or takes off every one to two minutes. This rate of operations makes many homes intolerable under an assault of constant noise. Increasing the operational efficiency of the airport would mean making a higher rate of operations with larger aircraft possible. And to Mr. Dahan's claim that the taxiways need to be uh, larger in order to accommodate larger aircraft, well, you could use smaller aircraft and you have the same issue. You never said that. Federal law prevents the county from restricting the type, timing, volume, or flight paths of aircraft using the airport. This is why the Board of Legislators in 2003 passed a resolution against any increase in air airport capacity. It is also why the terminal use regulations restricting airline operations are so important. Yet the RFP before you and this master plan ignores this reality in calling for capacity expansion, which will inevitably, inevitably lead to increased adverse environmental impact. In May, County Executive Latimer promised a significant revamp of the airport master plan, this time with real public input. Four months have passed, and we've gotten an RFP that was written without any input from residents or the airport advisory board. Instead, it reads like it was written by an airport consultant whose business is the expansion of airports. The RFP specifies that the consultant will, quote, rely on the recommendations included in the 2017 master plan. If you could sum up, please. Those recommendations for a dramatic expansion of airport capacity were rejected in the 2017 public hearing, in the 2017 elections, and again up. at three public hearings this year. How many times does the public have to say no before the county will listen? Our county legislator is here. Would you like to speak? I don't want to put you on the spot. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. anyone, does anyone else? I'll just yeah. say, if you don't want, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, you know, what, what's happened here is that this master plan was developed at a time when there was a very different um, focus of, of the administration. And it was developed at a time when there was a focus to be able to maximize um, the, um, the economic and financial impact. And, and we know that because we saw what happened with the uh, privatization um, plans. So, I mean, that's what I'm basing this on. Um, so now there's a lot of distrust among community members who feel like, you know, this, that they were promised that this would be revisited and I think it is being revisited, and I think community members, you know, need to be patient. But I, I do think we need a dialogue. And and when you hear sort of one side, it sounds very reasonable and good. And uh, but without hearing the other side, it, it's really not the full picture. So I just think it would be great if everybody could listen to each other right. in a calm. Well, the purpose of the meeting here was to give the board members the background, Absolutely. you know, the history. Uh, it's, it's, we have not seen an RFP, we haven't been involved, but we wanted to see the history. Maybe time for one more. And also the process. 
going over the process is very essential with everybody on the board so everybody understands moving forward how these things are evaluated. That was a very important part of this presentation. So, yes. Hi, my name is Dukey Baxter. I'm a resident of Mount Pleasant. Um, I've lived in my home for 45 years. And I appreciate what it's like to be on the planning board and a very dear friend who's on the Mount Pleasant planning board. I'm also representing Mount Pleasant's Airport Advisory Committee. I'm speaking as someone who's living under these plans. And so when I'm hearing things like we're staying in the footprint, I've been in my home 45 years. The footprint from living under these planes is not the same. I, I can see all the charts and everything. I'm telling you from my heart. Last week, or 10 days ago, when I called the, uh, the you know, your report, uh, we write reports. Every day my house is shaking. But last week a plane went over, I thought it was going to crash into my house. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like one time in Westchester we had an earthquake. The walls were moving. They are so low, so big, so loud, every five minutes on some days. So that's not all these charts. That's not in the same footprint. It is radically changed. And I need you to hear what it is like to live that. And we're paying some of the highest taxes in the United States. So when I'm hearing we flew over and we looked at the trees and, and this nice gentleman gave me a seat. I don't want to see them. When I'm looking at seat. I'm part of the environment too. And believe me, I have great respect for the water and all that. But when you're flying over, there are people living under this. Then I'm wondering, because I know right around this area, water's not potable. And I know what happened up at Stewart. My water supply, in Mount Pleasant, we have a small little lake. So I'm in Old Farm Road Lake District. The water supply's right there. These planes are flying, it's almost like they're on a little tightrope. It's the same flight pattern. That didn't used to be. So my house, day after day after day. What is that environmental impact? I don't see that here. What is it's happening to my water that I'm drinking? I have to worry about all of that. And as far as the voluntary curfew, Sunday night at 3 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock. So where it used to be a gentleman's agreement and that was listened to, it has been abandoned. My guess is it has to do with the FBOs, but I don't know. All I know is there is no more respect for the voluntary curfew. Okay, thank so you very much. Um, I <laughs> just, I, just to let you know, I live in Port Chester. I live yes. right under the flight path. Yes. This board will take all that information into account. Uh, I'm sorry we have to cut it short, but we're already over time for this room. Chairman, so, can, 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 I, say one thing about can I get a, can I get a motion oh, to adjourn the meeting, please? Okay. I got a question. Okay. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. Thank you all for coming.